cold, still night of December 15, 2020, blanketed the small village of Kanyak Lemin in an eerie silence. Nestled in the rolling hills of southern France, this quiet community rarely saw any disturbances. But that night, as the clock crept towards midnight, a single house stood out in the darkness, its interior lights flickering like a beacon of distress. Inside, Cedric Jubiar paced the living room, his mind racing with a growing sense of unease. His wife, Delphine, had told him she was stepping out to walk the dogs, a routine so mundane that it hardly warranted a second thought. But now, hours later, the dogs had returned alone, their leashes dragging through the mud, and Delphine was nowhere to be found. The minutes stretched into an agonizing eternity, and with each passing second, Cedric's anxiety deepened. He grabbed his phone, his fingers trembling as he dialed her number again. No answer. Just the cold, indifferent tone of her voicemail. The stillness of the house seemed oppressive, almost mocking. He checked every room, calling her name, hoping she had somehow returned without him noticing. But there was nothing. Only the soft hum of the refrigerator and the ticking of a wall clock echoing through the emptiness. Frantic now. Cedric stepped outside, the frigid air biting at his skin. He scanned the darkness, hoping to catch a glimpse of her familiar figure walking back up the road. But the night offered no clues, only the distant hoot of an owl and the rustle of leaves in the wind. Panic tightened its grip on him as he realized something was terribly wrong. He rushed back inside and dialed the gendarmerie, his voice trembling as he explained that his wife was missing. Within minutes, the small village, usually so quiet at this hour, buzzed with activity. Neighbors, roused from their sleep by the flashing blue lights, emerged from their homes, pulling coats over their pajamas as they joined the search. They combed through the narrow streets and surrounding fields, calling Delphine's name into the night. But it was as if she had vanished into thin air. For those who knew Delphine, the shock was immediate and profound. She wasn't the type to just disappear. A mother of two children, aged six years and 18 months at the time of her disappearance, worked as a night nurse in the geriatrics department of the Claude Bernard Clinic in Albi. During the challenging year of 2020, she volunteered to work in the clinic's COVID unit dedicated to helping and supporting patients afflicted by the virus. Her disappearance felt incomprehensible to those who knew her. How could someone so rooted in her life, so responsible and loving, simply disappear? As the night wore on, the once unthinkable possibility began to take hold in everyone's mind. Something terrible had happened to Delphine Jubilar. The morning after Delphine's disappearance, the small village of Kanyak le mine awoke to an unsettling reality. News spread quickly through the tight-knit community where everyone knew everyone. Delphine Jubillar was missing, and the tranquility that had always defined this place was shattered. In a village like Kanyak le mine where life moved at a leisurely pace and strangers were a rarity, Delphine's disappearance was more than just alarming. It was a profound disturbance in the fabric of daily life. People who had seen her just the day before, laughing with her children, chatting with neighbors, now found themselves grappling with the impossible. How could someone like Delphine, so embedded in the community, simply vanish? The community rallied quickly. Volunteers organized searches, scouring the nearby woods, fields, and riverbanks. The local cafe became a command center, where villagers gathered to exchange information, offer support, and speculate on what might have happened. As the hours turned into days with no sign of Delphine, the initial shock gave way to a swirl of theories and speculations. In a place where everyone was accustomed to the familiar routines of small-town life, the idea that Delphine might have left of her own accord seemed unfathomable. Some whispered about the possibility of an accident. Perhaps she had fallen and injured herself while out walking the dogs, lying somewhere unable to call for help. Others suggested she might have had a sudden medical emergency, though those who knew her dismissed this idea. Delphine was in good health, and she had no history of any condition that might explain her disappearance. But as each theory was considered, and then discarded, darker possibilities began to creep into the conversation. Could she have been abducted? The thought was chilling, almost too terrifying to entertain, but as more time passed, it became harder to dismiss. The idea of foul play was almost beyond belief, yet with every passing hour, it became increasingly difficult to avoid. The local media quickly picked up on the story, and within days, Delphine's face was splashed across regional newspapers and news broadcasts. 
The narrative of a missing young mother in a peaceful village struck a chord with the public, and soon the story began to spread beyond the region. To the outside world, Delphine and Cedric Jubiar appeared to be a typical couple. They had met as teenagers in 2006, both just 18, and their relationship had blossomed quickly. Friends described them as inseparable in those early years, two young people deeply in love and excited about their future together. In 2011, they married in a small, intimate ceremony, a day filled with hope and promise. They soon welcomed two children into their lives, a son and a daughter, cementing their bond as a family. But as the years passed, the initial spark that had brought them together began to fade. The demands of raising children coupled with financial pressures and the stress of daily life started to strain their relationship. Cedric, a plasterer and painter by trade, worked long hours but struggled to maintain steady employment. Delphine, on the other hand, thrived in her career as a nurse, earning the respect and admiration of her colleagues and patients. The disparity in their professional lives began to create tension at home. Their home, a house that was supposed to be a symbol of their shared dreams, became a source of frustration. The house was never quite finished. Unfinished walls, exposed pipes, and a yard littered with construction debris told the story of a project that had lost its way. The husband promises to finish the undone work, never fulfilled. The area that was supposed to become a beautiful swimming pool slowly morphed into a cluttered heap of rusting metal scraps and forgotten toys, a grim reminder of broken promises and unfulfilled dreams. Instead of the oasis Delphine had envisioned, their backyard became a testament to Cedric's neglect, a physical manifestation of the disarray that had begun to take over their lives. Behind the closed doors of their home, arguments became more frequent. Friends and family noticed that Delphine's once bright smile seemed to dim, and there were whispers that all was not well between the couple. Cedric, by many accounts, had become increasingly withdrawn, spending more time with his hobbies, which included a growing dependence on cannabis and less time engaging with his family. Delphine, ever the optimist, tried to keep things together, but the cracks in their relationship were becoming too large to ignore. During one of her outings in 2018, Delphine confided in her cousin that she was no longer happy in her marriage and was planning to ask for a divorce. At 33 years old, Delphine had informed her husband, Cedric Jubilar, at the end of October 2020, of her intention to divorce. She had already scheduled a meeting with a lawyer and started the initial steps toward separation, a decision that Cedric did not take well, suspecting her of having an affair. In his quest for proof, he attempted to track her movements through geolocation, closely monitor her activities, and scrutinize her banking records. As investigators dug deeper into the circumstances surrounding Delphine's disappearance, they uncovered a secret that would change the course of the investigation, a secret that added a dark layer of complexity to the case. Delphine, the devoted wife and mother, had been having an affair. The revelation came as a shock to those who knew her, but as the details emerged, a picture of a woman trapped in an unhappy marriage began to form. Delphine had met her lover online, a man who lived in Montauban, a town about an hour's drive from cagnac le -Mine. Their relationship had started innocently enough, a way for Delphine to escape the monotony and dissatisfaction she felt at home. But what began as harmless flirtation quickly escalated into something more serious, that was in July 2020, about two months before Delphine filed the divorce papers. For Cedric, this revelation was devastating. Though he had suspected that something was amiss in their marriage, the confirmation of Delphine's affair struck him like a blow. Investigators began to piece together a narrative of a man who was losing control. Of his life, of his marriage, of everything that had once given him purpose. The affair provided a clear motive, one that could explain the unthinkable. The sense of foreboding was palpable. The villagers, who had once rallied around Cedric, began to look at him with suspicion. What had really happened behind closed doors on the night of December 15th? The truth, it seemed, was hiding in the shadows, waiting to be uncovered. As the days turned into weeks, the gendarmerie intensified their search for clues, focusing on the Jubilar home. A team of forensic experts was brought in, their mission clear find any trace, no matter how small, that could explain what had happened to Delphine. The house, with its half-finished walls and cluttered rooms, became the center of a meticulous investigation. The forensic team combed through every inch of the property. 
They dusted for fingerprints, searched for signs of a struggle, and used luminol to detect any traces of blood that might have been cleaned up. The yard, with its piles of debris and unfinished landscaping, was excavated in the hopes of uncovering something buried. Yet, despite their thorough efforts, the results were frustratingly inconclusive. No blood, no significant fibers, no clear signs of violence, nothing that definitively pointed to foul play. The house seemed to be holding on to its secrets, keeping the truth just out of reach. The police were reconstructing Delphine's schedule and interviewed several people, her eldest son, her neighbors, and her friends. Louis, the couple's eldest son, who was just six years old at the time, recalled sitting beside his mother, watching their favorite French TV show, a familiar routine that lulled him into a false sense of normalcy. As the credits rolled at around 09.50 p.m., his eyes heavy with sleep, he went to his room at around 10.30 p.m., leaving behind the last moments he would ever share with his mother, unaware that his life was about to change forever. This is when he witnessed his parents in the midst of a heated argument. Standing behind the partially open hallway door, he saw arms outstretched horizontally, grasping at one another, movements unmistakably associated with a dispute. This scene unfolded in the living room, where the Christmas tree stood, firmly situating the events on December 15th. Stop it, Delphine is reported to have told her husband. When a neighbor was interviewed, he stated that Delphine never took care of the dogs and certainly never walked them, especially not at night. This directly contradicted her husband's claim that she went out to walk the dogs and never returned home. Around 11 p.m., two neighbors heard screams of terror and fear, and then nothing but silence. Witnesses confirmed that the couple's vehicle had changed direction during the night of Delphine Jubillard's disappearance, meaning that someone used the car that night. At four in the morning of December 2020, Cedric was frantically typing messages into a group chat of her friends. The stillness of the early hours was pierced by his urgent words, asking if anyone had seen Delphine. Each friend replied in turn, their answers the same. No, they hadn't seen her. This is when Cedric called the police. All the testimonials about Delphine's disappearance became disturbingly clear to the investigators. So whatever happened to Delphine must have occurred within a narrow, critical window, from the moment the television show ended at 10.50 p.m. until Cedric's first message at 4 a.m., there were just over five hours unaccounted for. These hours, shrouded in mystery and darkness, held the key to understanding Delphine's fate. Somewhere in that sliver of time, her life had unraveled, and she vanished without a trace. What immediately drew suspicion to Cedric was the unnerving speed with which he contacted the police. In less than ten minutes after messaging Delphine's friends, he was on the phone with the authorities, his voice shaking with urgency. It was as if he had been expecting something to go wrong, his actions premeditated and precise. To the investigators, his haste suggested not a frantic husband, but a man who knew too much too soon. His behavior was not of someone discovering his wife was missing, it was of someone who was preparing for the inevitable, casting a dark shadow over his every move. Initially viewed as a grieving husband, his behavior began to raise eyebrows both within the investigation and among the public. As media coverage intensified, so did the scrutiny of Cedric's actions in the days following Delphine's disappearance. The investigators adopted a strategy of close surveillance, hoping that Cedric might slip up or reveal something incriminating. They tapped his phone, monitored his movements, and conducted further interviews with anyone who might shed light on his state of mind. They also continued to search the house and surrounding areas, this time with dogs. During one of the Jubilar house searches, a pair of glasses belonging to Delphine Jubilar was found broken. The shattered frame lay on the kitchen table, and a detached arm was discovered under the living room sofa. The glasses were seized by investigators during a search. According to analyses conducted by experts, the breakages were consistent with a violent incident. This finding supports the theory of a fierce argument. There were reports that he had appeared oddly calm, even detached, as the search for his wife continued. Some noted that he had been less involved in the search efforts than one might expect from a desperate husband. Instead of leading the charge to find Delphine, he seemed to recede into the background, allowing others to take up the cause. Shortly after Delphine's disappearance, Cedric wasted no time diving into the world of dating apps, striking up conversations with multiple women as if nothing had happened. In one exchange, he boldly claimed that he loved his single life and vowed that he would never let a woman control him again. 
The most shocking, however, was the choice of his profile picture, a smiling shot of him with his new girlfriend, flaunting his new relationship for all to see. But his immature provocations didn't stop there. Cedric sent taunting messages to Delphine's friends, mocking them as they desperately searched for her, ridiculing their t-shirts and how they looked on camera, showing a chilling lack of empathy for the woman he once called his wife. He had confided in his new girlfriend and a former inmate, claiming he had hidden his wife's body in the burned-down farm. A farm located less than three kilometers from the Jubiler residence, which was thoroughly searched. However, his lawyers and then-girlfriend dismissed this statement as yet another of Cedric's provocative remarks, delivered with a tone of irony. Regarding the technical analysis of Cedric Jubilar's phone, they revealed contradictions with his own statements and usual habits. The activity of his mobile phone stopped at 11.08 p.m. on December 15, 2020. However, according to experts, the phone still had 40% battery remaining. Furthermore, the Game of Thrones app, an online game Cedric was addicted to, was interrupted at 10.04 p.m. that night, despite Cedric's claim that the game stops only when his phone dies because the battery is empty. Additionally, during his police custody in June 2021, Cedric stated that he had put his phone in airplane mode, while technicians determined that it was simply turned off. Whether this was a deliberate shutdown or a result of his device malfunctioning due to poor charging capacity remains unclear. These conclusions were based on network monitoring, which track network activities between a phone and a nearby cell tower that reacts to its presence. All suspicion points to Cedric Jubilar, as he was the only one in the vicinity so close to the house. He denied having his wife's phone in his possession, which was permanently turned off at 7.48 a.m. on December 16, 2020. At 6.52 a.m. during the last interaction with this phone, Cedric Jubilar was in the presence of the police, his lawyer stated. With suspicion mounting, the police began to hone in on Cedric as their prime suspect. Although they lacked direct evidence tying him to a crime, they believed that his behavior, the gathered testimonials, combined with the revelations about Delphine's affair, pointed to a possible motive— they theorized that Cedric, already struggling with feelings of inadequacy and failure, might have been pushed over the edge upon learning that Delphine intended to leave him for another man. In addition to this, Delphine was the sole breadwinner, providing the only income for the household. Once she initiated the divorce proceedings, she took the decisive step of closing their joint bank account. For Cedric, the divorce represented a significant loss. He stood to lose everything. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, the police believed that time was on their side. They were convinced that Cedric was hiding something, and they were determined to uncover it. The investigation, once broad and open-ended, had now narrowed its focus almost exclusively on him. The question was no longer just about finding Delphine. It was about proving what many had begun to suspect, that Cedric Jubilar knew more than he was letting on. The tipping point came when investigators, after months of surveillance and wiretaps, uncovered what they believed to be a damning piece of evidence. During a late-night phone conversation with a friend, Cedric made a cryptic comment. They'll never find her. To the investigators, this was as close to a confession as they were going to get. Combined with the deteriorating state of the marriage, Cedric's jealousy over Delphine's affair, and the increasingly erratic behavior he exhibited after her disappearance, they believed they had enough to move forward. On June 18, 2021, six months after Delphine was last seen, police descended on the Jubiler home in the early hours of the morning. Cedric was arrested and taken into custody, the flashing lights of the police vehicles reflecting off the still unfinished walls of the house where the couple's dreams had so tragically unraveled. The news of Cedric's arrest sent shockwaves through Cagnac le Mine and beyond. The village, already deeply unsettled by Delphine's disappearance, now found itself at the center of a growing media circus. Reporters swarmed the streets, cameras capturing every angle of the house that had once been the backdrop to a seemingly normal family life. Public opinion, which had been divided, began to solidify against Cedric. The media's portrayal of him shifted from a grieving husband to a likely killer. Headlines screamed of a jealous man driven to the brink by his wife's betrayal of a cold and calculated crime hidden beneath the veneer of normalcy. Social media lit up with speculation, 
with many condemning Cedric before he had even faced trial. Friends and acquaintances of Delphine, who had initially supported Cedric, began to distance themselves. The narrative had shifted, and with it, the support that Cedric once had from the community eroded rapidly. The air was thick with a sense of betrayal, not just by Cedric, but by the very idea that someone they knew could be capable of such a crime. Cedric was formally charged with voluntary homicide, a charge that, in the French legal system, carries severe penalties. The prosecution's case rested on the circumstantial evidence they had gathered. The deteriorating marriage, the affair, the mysterious disappearance, and Cedric's own incriminating statements. During his interrogation, Cedric maintained his innocence. He was adamant that he had nothing to do with Delphine's disappearance, insisting that she had either run away or fallen victim to some unknown fate. He was cooperative but firm, refusing to admit to any wrongdoing. His lawyers quickly pointed out the lack of direct evidence, emphasizing that nobody had been found and that the entire case against him was built on inference and speculation. But the wheels of justice had begun to turn, and Cedric now found himself at the center of a legal maelstrom. As he sat in his cell, awaiting his day in court, planned for the end of 2024, the world outside continued to speculate, judge, and condemn. The case against him was far from airtight, but the momentum was undeniable. The stage was set for a courtroom battle that would determine not only his fate, but also the truth about what had happened to Delphine Jubillar. As the legal proceedings loomed, the prosecution faced a significant challenge. Despite their firm belief in Cedric's guilt, they were painfully aware that their case was built almost entirely on circumstantial evidence. The most glaring weakness was the absence of Delphine's body. Without it, there was no definitive proof of a crime, no cause of death, no concrete link between Cedric and an act of violence. The forensic searches had turned up nothing substantial, no blood, no weapon, no trace of Delphine in the house or surrounding areas. The defense seized on this lack of evidence, crafting their strategy around the idea that Cedric was being wrongfully accused based on assumptions and public pressure rather than hard facts. They argued that the police had been too quick to focus on Cedric, ignoring other potential leads in their rush to solve a high-profile case. The defense painted a picture of a man who was flawed, yes, but not a murderer. A man who was being unfairly targeted because of his wife's affair and the media's narrative. The defense suggested alternative scenarios. What if Delphine had left voluntarily, overwhelmed by the pressures of her life and her affair? What if she had met with an accident while out walking, her body hidden by the rugged terrain? They urged the jury to consider the possibility that the real story was more complex than the prosecution's straightforward narrative of a jealous husband turned killer. The stakes are incredibly high. For Cedric, it is a matter of life and death. If convicted, he faced the possibility of spending the rest of his life behind bars. For the prosecution, it was a chance to deliver justice for Delphine and her grieving family, to show that even in the absence of a body, the truth could be uncovered and a killer brought to justice. As the trial date approached, the tension in cagnac le mine and indeed across France, reached a fever pitch. The trial would not only decide Cedric's fate, but would also determine whether the mystery of Delphine's disappearance would finally be resolved, or if it would remain an open wound a question mark hanging over the village and the nation.